let's move on to our commentators and let me start with Ambassador Hegazi, please. If it doesn't work, I'll give you this one. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abla. Uh, allow me at the outset uh, to welcome Samir uh, Soran and Sanji Gucci uh, and my fellow colleague Tariq Osman and Ala Hashim and the uh, honorable uh, dignitaries on the dais as well as uh, our dear uh, colleagues, uh, the audience who will uh, bear it uh, with us to identify the way forward for our uh, uh, very important ties and relations. Allow me also to recognize the presence of the Indian Commercial uh, Office and the team of the Indian Embassy uh, and the many uh, media colleagues uh, whom uh, we have uh, worked hard over uh, the past decades to revive and to bring back the India-Egypt relation to where it belongs. No subject close to uh, my heart uh, than talking about India-Egypt uh, relations. And I was uh, truly taken uh, by the uh, historical analysis and the ties uh, of synergies and commonalities that has been put by uh, Sanjay Gucci and the futuristic and realistic approach uh, that Professor uh, Saran has described, which I personally uh, will benefit a lot uh, from being also the chairman of the India-Egypt uh, Partnership uh, and Friendship Society. Uh, having said that, I have to say that uh, we worked hard over the years from Amr Musa to Nabil al-Arabi uh, to myself and many others colleagues to keep these relations uh, as the voice of the third world as a voice of the interdependence that will allow both of us benefit from each other. Uh, from the historical background and the futuristic approach, I don't want really to go far from the bilateral ties because I want to make benefit of the many uh, heads and minds of uh, the economic, strategic uh, 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 leaders who are here uh, with us uh, today for that, I should thank Dr. Abla uh, for allowing such an exchange. Uh, I remember uh, when I was preparing for a very important visit of late President Mubarak uh, to India, that I crafted many agreements and I put it on the table. Among the uh, very different agreement was a space a technology memorandum of understanding where Egypt and India in 2009 will work together in the space technology. I remember very well uh, Pratiba uh, Patel, uh, president of India at that time, uh, told our president that this very particular memorandum is a show that we have not only think about our investment, our trade, though important, but Pratiba Patel said, but this document shows that we have a future together, a future where Egypt and India can truly uh, talk about uh, many aspects of cooperation. Our uh, trade, which is now on the six point, uh, uh, two six, as I recall, the latest number is important. Uh, our investment is growing by, I think, a reasonable base, but we still can think a lot about the future. I remember uh, the um, Egyptian Minister of Trade and Industry coming to visit uh, India. I tried with all my communication. I was all over uh, the place to uh, collect projects so that our investment part of the presidential visit becomes very strong. I collected around 33 million US dollar value of projects. At that time, at the beginning of the visit, I presented it to the Minister of Trade and Industry who told me, Ambassador, this is a wish list. This is a wish list, 33 
billion US dollar at that time, 2009, was a huge amount of money or a huge amount of Indian expected investments in Egypt because most of them were energy consuming projects. Uh, Tata steel, aluminium, plastics, and many other projects that is energy consuming projects. At that time, Egypt didn't have the potential of renewable, the potential of natural gas it has today. So when Dr. Habla referred to the uh, uh, north uh, uh, west uh, or, uh, or west of the Suez Canal industrial uh, zone, I was uh, really uh, happy to reconsider my uh, suggestion that if Indian companies thought of those same projects in Egypt today, maybe we can compensate the energy requirements and uh, introduce uh, the green hydrogen, the renewable, and the many uh, projects that can be done on, um, uh, in my country. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the Suez Canal uh, Economic Zone is uh, an important place where India can install, as uh, Russian did, as the Chinese in Teda uh, have built. So I invite uh, the commercial office, definitely, uh, and the uh, uh, investors from uh, India uh, to consider uh, this very important projects where you will have uh, a country of a very important population, and you have also a country with in uh, contractual relations with Europe, with the United States, with the Arab region, uh, where Egypt can really be, as Dr. Abla put it, your gate to Africa. Uh, going further into our bilateral uh, relations, I think uh, we agree with Dr. Saran that the strategic situation is so colliding and so complicated where geography, ideas, uh, climate, are interacting. But uh, back again in this uh, 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 confusing uh, or world in disarray, what can we, India, Egypt, uh, can do together? Of course, Dr. Saran map and agenda is so important. Multilateralism is important. But let me bring you back from the global disarray uh, image that has been uh, uh, described to the bilateral ties between us. Two very important uh, regional powers, Egypt in the Middle East and the Arab world and Africa, and India in Asia, uh, and it's global also, uh, uh, what can we say, policies that has brought back to uh, the world community uh, what it means uh, to protect our uh, third world national interest, G20 India, was one of those very important examples. So if I thought about this world of this array, I remember that India, a regional power, and Egypt has a very important area of interest, not only in Africa or in the Arab world, but also in the Gulf region. India policy, and let us be very clear, that we in Egypt feel that India over the past decades has given their relations uh, with the Gulf countries more interest than what was in the Middle East. Thanks to the uh, late visits of uh, 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 Prime Minister Modi and President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi to each other, that we created this commonality of understanding the stabilization of the Gulf region and the Red Sea, particularly today, is very important common denominator uh, to India-Egypt relations. And uh, without uh, being polarized, working as India uh, and, uh, foreign policy into the Gulf region, uh, let us work together because stabilizing the Gulf, uh, stabilizing the Red Sea are the core of our strategic alliance. A uh, third element uh, uh, is related to terrorism. We have came also uh, from very far. Both uh, countries have conducted a very important battle 
uh, to gain on terrorism. And uh, we have exchanged, we have made visits, uh, we have cooperated in the field. Uh, we came to understand also India, national interest and need to combat uh, terrorism. But we need India also to understand that your policies over the past decades have departed from the traditional uh, affinity uh, to certain uh, questions and ideas that we in the Arab world are built to believe in, like the Palestinian question. Uh, in a framework where our relations has to be rephrased, re-enhanced, uh, rethinking of the future on your agenda, as we have come closer in issues like terrorism, strategic military cooperation, being it uh, armed forces or navy, we have done that. But we need India to come closer also to the previous antes and to uh, the historical uh, position of India to the Palestinian issue. Lacking of doing that, we are not losing on the political arena, which I think we are very much uh, together in many issues, uh, and we can see eye to eye, but in this very particular issue, you will not see it eye to eye with Egypt only. You will see it too uh, with the 500 million Arabs, uh, Muslim and Christians living in this region. So this is to ad uh, address the real issues. Why? Because we value the relations with India and we don't want it to be identical to us, but we want it also this to understand our uh, core issues where the heart of the Arab world lies. Uh, back again to our strategic uh, cooperation. I said naval, I said armed forces, and that shows you that we both have understood the importance of our geographical positioning. We are not colliding, we are integrating uh, our relations. Egypt, as I said, is an important uh, market. I don't know whether Dr. Abla uh, will take you to visit the new capital. We talked about museums, but go to visit the new capital. See the determination and the will of this nation on reshaping the desert and to reshape the future as well. I'll stop here because I know Tariq and Adel has a lot to, has a lot to, to say and comment, but I want to bring you closer to how a veteran diplomat who loves India and serves his country is commenting on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. I mean, you focused on the bilateral relations between the two countries at all levels, okay? And you brought attention to something that's very specific that I'm sure our Indian colleagues from RF <coughs> would want to comment on after that. But now, Mr. Tari. Thank you, and um, first of all, I want to start by really thanking uh, ECS, uh, Dr. Abla, friends like Mr. Mohammed for the invitation to be here. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. And also, I'm really grateful for, for being here because, I forgot to mention that I must thank the treasurer, I understand. This is very important. This is where the money is, so, so very thanks to Allah as well. <laughs> I'm also very grateful to be here to, uh, to listen to Mr. Sanjoy and to Dr. Samir because probably I'm not the only one here who get many opportunities to listen to, to voices from the West, from Europe, from, from America, but at least in my case, I do not get many chances to listen to voices from Asia, from the East. Uh, so I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Uh, it's, it's not just the rise in powers, but it's... Uh, it's a truly very important culturally, politically, of course, economically sphere of the world right now. So opportunities like these are very valuable for, for all of us. So again, thanks for organizing it and thanks for coming. <coughs> From my side, I only have three points and just it's, it's macro points as food for thought for all of us. And the first is that to be blunt, I look at our experience in Egypt and by extension in the Arab world, 
since what we call the beginning of modernity in this part of the world, so roughly 200 years ago. And I say that we have achieved a lot, but we also have lost a lot, including many opportunities. And I'm not particularly sure that many people who started looking at our experience, including our four bearers, our forefathers, in the mid 19th, late 19th century, early mid 20th century, would look at us today and say, ah, we've done amazing. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, which means that I think as, as an Egyptian, as somebody who belongs also to the Arab world, I think we certainly out of respect for reality ought to, to say that we ought to learn uh, from many experiences globally. Now it seems to me, I'm not in any way an expert on India. I've never been to India. Uh, I just read a lot, but I do not know. But from, from what I hear about India, particularly in the West, it seems India has done really well in so many areas. I don't know, you seem to disagree, but <laughs> you agree, right? Yeah, so, so it seems India has done extremely well in many things. We have just had the Indian elections a few days ago, and not just that we have, I don't know, over a billion people or something, or at least hundreds of millions of people who have gone to a fair, inclusive elections, um, but the level of attention that has been paid worldwide to the Indian elections, how important that is, let alone, of course, the tremendous growth economically, let alone, I don't know, lifting how many hundreds of millions of people from real poverty to the thresholds of serious middle class by international standards. So India has done some things very right. So it seems to me that us in, in Egypt and in the Arab world, not just out of humility, but out of, out of reality, ought to pay serious attention to India and what has happened there, particularly that we have affinities. We were talking before this talk that I spent many, many years of my life in the UK and in Europe, and I think I I'm one of the people who believe that those in the mid and late and 19th century and early 20th century in the Arab world, in Egypt, who, who decided to look to Paris, to Vienna, to Roma, to, to London, out of inspiration were right, in my view. It was right to look to Europe at that time, absolutely. In my view, people might disagree with me, but I, I agree with that. Um, but we've never had enough serious cultural, psychological, historical affinity to Europe, in my, in my view. Again, people sometimes disagree with that. But I think there are certainly many affinities, cultural um, and historical, with India, which means that our learning from the Indian experience will have serious foundations. The second point, to move quickly, looking at the geopolitics, but also the geoeconomic scene globally, on the global south, Dr. Samir Saran mentioned a number of countries, and I'm sure all of them will do extremely well, but it seems to me that India is probably one of the countries in the global south that have very serious potential of achieving the stance or the status of a global power in the next, I don't know, 10 years or something. Now, I doubt that many other countries in the global south will achieve that. I mean, in China obviously is out of that. China now is talking about a, a superpower status. But we're talking about global south. It seems to me if there's one country that has a real chance of achieving a global power, I'm not saying superpower, I'm saying global power it seems to me that India could very well be that country, which means that Egypt, as well as the Arab world, ought to develop and invest into that relationship because it is a country with which we have many connections. And if it has a, if it has a serious chance of becoming a global power, then out of just pure, I'm not, I don't want to say expediency, but pure interest, we ought to develop our relationships 
with that country. And the final point is something that Mr. Ambassador mentioned, the Gulf. Now, to me, this is a very interesting point because the Gulf, I mean, we always lump the Arab world together, which is a separate discussion altogether, but it seems to me that the Gulf is really on the verge of a major transformation right now. We have all have been, I'm sure, to Dubai and Abu Dhabi over the past 10, 20 years and have seen what has happened there. Saudi is going through, Saudi Arabia is going through arguably the most interesting transformation, not just economic but political and cultural. Of course, there's immense wealth going on right now. I think Kuwait is witnessing very interesting changes or will witness. So what I'm trying to say is that if there is a power, collective power in the Arab world that probably will play even further roles in the future, whether in the Arab political economy or globally, probably that power collectively will be in the Gulf or, or the Gulf will be leading certain very influential roles in Arab political economy and beyond. It's already, by the way, very powerful in Europe. So what I'm trying to say is that the question is what is or what are the orientations of the Gulf? And it seems to me it is, we can easy say, easily say, oh, the Arab Brotherhood and Arab history and all of that. Yes, of course. But also it seems to me that the Gulf is going through transformations culturally, not just economically and politically. Now, as Mr. Ambassador, I think rightfully said, India has had tremendous investments in the Gulf, cultural investments, even before political and economic. I was in Dubai when Prime Minister Narendra Modi was there in February, and I've seen not just the reception, but the size and the scope of the delegation. I mean, tremendous. So what I'm trying to say is that it seems to me that the Indian thinking, Indian way of looking at the future will probably influence, will probably be in the ingredients in the kitchen of the Gulf. And therefore, if we in the Arab world have a player who probably will be a serious influencer in the global arena and in our political economy, that is the Gulf, it makes sense for us to try to understand another key player in the kitchen there, which is India. I don't know if the, if this is, if the message is coming across or not, but I hope I'm not making it too confusing. India is very culturally influential. People in the Gulf look at it with a strong interest. If the Gulf is going to play a major role globally and in our political economy as Arab world, it makes sense for us to understand what does India really want from the Gulf and from the Arab world and try to find common grounds, at least try to understand, because that will affect us and it will be the one player, the Gulf, that is likely to play a serious global role in the coming 10 years or so. I hope I didn't make it too complicated. Anyway, these are the three points. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Tari, for the, for the messages. Also, your, your focus is on the bilateral relation. And your message is really very simple. Unless we are really stupid, we should have strong relations with India. That's the, it comes down to this. <laughs> okay, This is what you said practically, creating the argument for it. Okay, And since we're a smart country, and we want to regain Egypt's positioning in the Arab world and in the region, so we are definitely go for that alliance. Ale. Thank you, Doctor. The treasurer has to have his own mic, of course. It wouldn't take so long. So I, I, I love how uh, Dr. Abla has been uh, pro propping me up. Like the, obviously, a lot of uh, checks I'm going to have to sign on my way out. But uh, if you know any talk about stupidity, if you know anything about Dr. Abla, is it's very <laughs> stupid to tell her no. So if you think like, the treasurer has power here, the, the, uh, our, I think uh, the treasurer's power is, uh, is the power to do what Dr. Abla asks. <laughs> so, uh, th thank you for the very distinguished panel. I really thoroughly enjoyed the, uh, uh, the talk by Mr. Saran and the opening remarks by Mr. Joshi, uh, Ambassador Hagezi. Thank you very much for very insightful remarks. And thank you for the stimulation really getting us thinking. Uh, so what I'm going to do, having the privilege of being the last and uh, hopefully uh, 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 try to, uh, to wrap this up uh, uh, not, uh, in, uh, in not so much time, I will uh, uh, recycle some of the ideas that were, that were already said and, uh, and build on them. But I'd love to really summarize the notes from uh, 
uh, Mr. Saran's uh, 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 speech, I think he talked about the four collisions. So again, setting the context for, I think, the global context where we operate. He talked about the geographic collision. So for example, in our region, we had a Arab Spring, and then the Arab Spring became an immigration crisis in Europe that's transforming the politics of Europe. Right, so I think it's that collision, that connectivity, uh, uh, I think that, that big collide. I think the other one is the real versus the virtual, how virtual platforms are not a tool, they're an extension of our identity. Today, I think there's more about us individually online that's being mined somewhere by AI that knows more about us, about our behaviors, about our preferences, about where we go and where we come from than we actually know about ourselves. So actually, I think the machines know more about us than we know about ourselves, and that already is a reality. This is not a future, and that's everybody in this room that has a smartphone. Uh, I think the third point is the planet versus people. I think, again, the brand of capitalism that we were indoctrinated with in the last 30 years has come at the expense of the planet because it was purely profit-seeking. I think the Milton Friedman uh, 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 school of thought that became commonplace in the 80s and the 90s, whereby, again, the, biz the, the purpose of business is profit at the expense of anything else. And you know what? You have the trickle-down effect. And again, profit is benevolent by nature. And just you just make a lot of money, and then good things are going to happen. I think that has been revised today. Again, as we see, I think the climate crisis that we're living today, I think one of the hottest summers that we've had on record. I think we've had the warmest winter probably on record in Egypt. I think we've, we've all lived this, an extremely warm winter. I had my t-shirt on 100% of the days in winter. I did not put on a jacket this year in winter, which is stunning. And the last one, I think it's the, the collision of the narratives. I think whether they are by ignorance or by design to divide people and or ignorance people just not understanding, but I think that collision, and we're seeing that in the manifestation of the rise of right between politics and identity politics globally. I think these collision of narratives, and we're also seeing it in terms of uh, geopolitical uh, frictions, all the, the, the wars, I think, that are erupting uh, around the world. And then I think he made a big theme around, so rather than being so instead of just sitting there and being passive, right, and letting the world define our destiny, it's this idea about taking agency. So how do we actually take control of the narrative? And I think he gave three phenomenal examples around what Indonesia, India, and Brazil did for the G20. Indonesia by saving the G20, India by adding ambition, and Brazil by centralizing that theme around equality in the G20. And then I think he suggested five specific themes for the agenda of the partnership between Egypt and India. One of them was this idea about multi-alignment. So, and again, it is not against anybody. It's just inclusive of everybody. Uh, the, uh, the second one is the just tr green transition, emphasizing the just, which is equitable. So it's not, again, green transition at the expense of our own development as a nation. It's how do we actually do a green transition while at the same time Again, also uh, uh, keeping our development needs uh, as the global south uh, uh, in check, leading digital transformation, particularly on the regulatory infrastructure. We have a huge opportunity to define the digital future through a, a regulatory, a proper regulatory infrastructure. And then I think he talked about reinventing globalization, defending slash reinventing globalization. Again, a globalization that works for all, not works for the one out of the, uh, the, the eight billion. So again, a globalization that works for all. And finally, I think reclaiming uh, the IPR. And I think it was more of a reclaiming of an IPR, not in terms of copyrights, intellectual property, it's on big ideas again. So again, we are not playing into somebody else's narrative. We are not applying a specific brand of ideology that's developed elsewhere. It's really understanding the roots of the, these ideas and owning it and making it my own. That I capture the essence of, of that. Very good. So I what? will embarrass the speaking for so long. <laughs> 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 Thank you. So, so what I would like to do actually is, is I'd just like to add just a few reflections of my own on this because I think I'm 100% in sick. I think uh, Egypt and India are two manifestations of the same struggle. It's the struggle of a people that are old people that have been colonized for many, many years. They just want peace, prosperity, and development. I think we are all in very messy neighborhoods. I think we have very diverse cultures. I think we have a lot of ideological luggage and baggage that, again, we carry throughout our long history. I think uh, we have very interesting geographical dividends. So, and, and again, we have large population dividends, whether young, large populations, and also our geography. So I think there's so much in common in terms of the real makeup of the struggle, the opportunity of the Egyptian and the Indian people. And I think the first I, big idea for me is I think we need to focus on learning from each other's failures, not only learning from each other's successes, mm -hmm. because I know India has went through a lot of, uh, a lot of failures themselves. 
socially and economic, in terms of social and economic policy, you speak to a lot of Indians, they, they just have this incredible, incredible intellectual honesty. They say, you know what, we screwed this up, we screwed this up, we screwed this up, we screwed this up, you know what, we learned, we're gonna move on, right? And, th and that for me, and we were just discussing this in the green room, it's like, you know what, I, this was crazy. I mean, this was absolute madness, right? And, but you know what, we learned and we're making progress, I think, but also I think they have, the, 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 the learning, particularly since we started the partnerships in the 50s and the 60s, where each, both Egypt and India were adopting a specific uh, uh, East-leaning socialist type of uh, 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 socioeconomic model for development, I think India has sort of made very clear choices after making a lot of experimentations. I think they went all over the place. But I think they have come to a certain degree of certainty around their socioeconomic development model, and I think that's an area where I think we can learn a lot. And decoupling these two things, because I think, again, in terms of social policy, how to actually impact, uh, 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 raise people from pro poverty, I think there are a lot of good and, and, and bad experiments, I think, that they uh, uh, learn from, that we can learn from, and we also can share a whole bunch of our own failures, and I think we're, we're, we can also be quite generous in sharing our, fa our failures there. And, and on that bit, I'd like to say, actually, so one of the uh, um, NGOs that I'm involved with, they actually learned, they went to, they, they, they developed community schools, their community-based learning organization, they went to India, to Pratam. Right? And they learned from Pratam, and they learned from the teaching at the right level, which is a program that they had adopted that helped millions and millions and millions educate poor, educate a lot of un uh, underprivileged Indians. And we took these models, and now we're applying them in Egypt in community schools and in public schools. And again, there's uh, so much learning that we were just not aware of. So, so my second big idea is, so if I would try to action what, what uh, uh, Mr. Saran had, uh, had mentioned, I think it is, how do we create a model for digi digital partnerships partnerships between uh, Egypt and, and India. Another example that I'm going to share on the business side is one of our portfolio companies. We do, we outsource our technology development to an Indian firm, but we don't outsource it in the sense of just go do something for us. We actually integrated the guys sitting in India with our teams, and they work together as a virtual team. So they have daily meetings, and these people are working as a development team together with Egyptian engineers at one end, and their extension on the Indian border on the other hand, and they're doing phenomenal phenomenal stuff together, right? And again, so it's leveraging the capabilities, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, not only the capabilities, but also the capacity of uh, uh, in the Indian uh, the tech sector as Egypt ramps up its own capacity in our tech sector, because we don't have the same capacity, whereby we have phenomenal uh, uh, talent, uh, digital talent in Egypt, but they're a lot more limited than they are in India. So there's, a, uh, I think, a huge unlock there. So I think forming these digital partnerships, understanding that theme about being a hub, so this, again, this idea about globalization and integration. So rather than saying, again, protectionism, and you know it's going to be your trade and my trade, is how do you partner up together to make Egypt and India as hubs, as redundancy hubs. So rather than looking at each other as competitors on certain turfs, how do we see each other as being the eastern hub, sort of, and the, uh, the, the middle hub. I'm not going to say the western hub, but I'm going to say the middle, Egypt's in the middle, or like uh, more, uh, uh, India's more east. But, but, but how we can create this redundancy uh, uh, between us. Uh, and finally, I think that idea around, again, particularly on security, cybersecurity, I think is a very, very, very hot topic and an area where I think both uh, India and Egypt can cooperate immensely in terms of actually setting the stage on that front end. So I, if I try to distill this agenda, and I think it's to Dr. Abla and us to think about, again, if we can create a frame where we can also engage business, we can engage academia, we can engage NGOs. So again, so it goes from G2G rather than, and really we dig down and create linkages at the private sector, at the, uh, at the NGO sector level. Within that framework, I think that was suggested, which I think was, uh, was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we're actually going to collaborate exactly along, along those lines, I mean, and, and others, but this is exactly what we were discussing today. Thank you, all three commentators, for excellent uh, commentary. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Tariq, for a very clear argument on why we really have, I mean, by, by all logic, we have, to, we have to collaborate with India and learn from its experience. Learning from failures before successes is definitely part of the story, the, the room and the positioning of India today really calls for serious consideration and of course the bilateral relation. 